Okay, so I heard uh, Matt talk at the BMEP seminar at Mayo. Uh, some of his background is he's educated at Notre Dame and Washington University of St. Louis, spent some time at GE and uh, now is at Washington, uh, like University of Washington in Seattle, doing cool stuff with MRI, ultrasound and photoacoustics. And those are just some of the things you'll hear from this talk tonight. So go ahead, Matt. Great, Tori, thank you, check. You, that was good. For, I asked her to do it in 30 seconds or less. Thank you for inviting me. I love giving uh, these talks as part of an IEEE uh, lecture series. And so let's get into it. Um, what we're going to talk about tonight is how to bring light and sound together to do some unusual things. And I'll show you why uh, we do that and what kind of applications. They go under three kind of rubrics, if you will. The first is photoacoustic imaging where light is used to generate sound. The second is uh, titled laser ultrasound. And here is you use light to detect sound. And the reason you would do that is so you can have non-contact detection of sound. And then the final one, which I hopefully uh, can spend uh, some time on so you can get a feeling for this one, but this is a little unusual. This is one in which we use light as the fundamental imaging uh, modality. In fact, the optical coherence tomography or OCT, which is used in, in ophthalmology for your eyes uh, routinely uh, now, we're using that, we're gonna leverage that technology, but we're gonna bring in sound to tickle the light. And what it allows us to do is to make non-contact measurements of elastic properties of uh, tissue. So let's get into the first one. This is photoacoustics where light generates sound. So first of all, the photoacoustic effect, which was discovered by Alexander Graham Bell, not Lord Rayleigh, not somebody else, but the inventor of the telephone was the one who actually discovered the photoacoustic effect. And the idea is uh, in one sense, straightforward, but very, very powerful. So consider that you were going to interrogate an object and you can think of this as like a piece of tissue or a test gelatin or something like that you would have in, in the lab, but within it is embedded a perfect light absorber at some wavelength. Think of it like a black bead that's just gonna absorb light. In a typical optical measurement, you would illuminate the object or a typical optical imaging measurement is you would illuminate the object with a spatially compact, i.e. a focused, but continuous wave light source, like a laser or even a tungsten filament, and scan that uh, focus around and look for the optical characteristics of the object. An alternate way is this photoacoustic effect. Here, we illuminate the object with light that is spatially diverse. It's very, very broad, the light, but the source is temporarily compact, i.e. the simplest way to think about that is that it's a pulsed source, okay? So you have a temporally compact, spatially extended. The light goes into this object and it will, uh, if it's a scattering object like a light in uh, tissue, in, in biomedicine, the light's gonna go everywhere. So you have no spatial definition at all, no imaging capability per se from the light, but the temporal characteristics induces a mechanism, this photoacoustic effect, which is related to absorption. So as this light bounces around, it's preferentially absorbed by this region, which has the high absorber. That absorption creates heat. Heat induces thermal expansion. By time modulating that thermal expansion, you create a particle velocity. A particle velocity is equivalent to a pressure wave or acoustic wave. And so this absorption of the pulse light will create an acoustic wave. Now, don't be afraid, I only got two or three equations in the whole, in the whole presentation, but why this one, why I put it up there? Because it, it really describes what's going on. That is, the left side is just a standard wave equation. That is, we're gonna have a propagating wave, okay? Which is determined, it's all acoustic. So the P is for the pressure, the C is the speed of sound in the material, not light, speed of sound. So this is an acoustic pressure wave. But the source part is all related to thermodynamic parameters, such as the coefficient of thermal expansion and how much heat is absorbed, that's the H. And the heat absorption is directly related 
to the optical parameters. When you do this low Gedanken experiment, you create an acoustic pulse, which can be detected if you do the timing right. So these are nanosecond scale pulsing. It'll create megahertz level uh, uh, acoustic waves, which you can detect with a conventional ultrasound transducer. And you can then image those acoustic sources. Okay, so by you can use traditional ultrasound means to image the sources. What that does is two things. One, it provides optical contrast. That is the, the mechanism creating the image, the brightness that you see in the image is optical, but it's at an ultrasound resolution because the imaging format is done with acoustics. What it does do, it allows you to overcome a fundamental limit of optical imaging in the body, and that is the penetration depth. Here, because we do not need coherence of the light source, we simply need there to uh, have this time modulation and have the light diffuse within the uh, object, is that we can get large penetration depth so we can do optical probing deep with inside the body. What this technology, which is dub photoacoustic imaging does, is it can bridge two worlds, the worlds of traditional medical ultrasound and the worlds of optical imaging. This is a typical imager's plot, which shows you the spatial resolution that you would have in an image as a function of the depth within the body. Optical imaging, as we know, has very high spatial resolution at the single micron level, but the penetrations typically is limited to about the scale of a millimeter inside the body. Ultrasound, on the other hand, can uh, propagate into the body tens of centimeters, which is why we can get those pictures of babies looking at the beating heart inside adults, et cetera. But its resolution is determined by the acoustic wavelengths, which are typically between 100 microns and a millimeter, so hundreds of microns. What photoacoustics allows us to do is to bridge these worlds. And that is, if I focus light, I still can uh, produce uh, uh, a um, image, which is related to the amount of optical absorption. But if I allow the light to diffuse at depth within the body, I can still make measurements uh, about this light absorption using traditional uh, ultrasound. What my lab has done has focused on the second uh, area, which is the integration of these pulsed light sources with traditional ultrasound uh, imaging system. And we call this integrated pause, photoacoustic and ultrasound imaging. So we can make images, we will simultaneously get conventional ultrasound images as well as these photoacoustic images. So that's the what of photoacoustic imaging, but I didn't tell you why. Why should you care? Why should you want to measure optical characteristics at depth? The reason is because it gets you in the world of molecular processes. Optics, and this has been true uh, for nearly a hundred years, is uh, uh, can, you can make contrast, molecular contrast, agents that will function at the scale of the molecular processes which are going inside the body, you can deliver it and make images of them. So fluorophores is the traditional, some nanosystems. Here now, you can change those agents slightly to make them high optical absorbers so that they become photoacoustic contrast agents. But now they still have that same exquisite molecular sensitivity, but unlike what you uh, can do with conventional optical systems with photoacoustics, you can image those agents deep within the body. And so there's been a large body of work over the last 15 years or so of developing these molecular contrast agents um, for doing photoacoustic imaging. An example, this is just one that was uh, recently developed uh, in our lab at Washington. Um, it's uh, an agent which is the nanoscale, so it's down in nanometer uh, size, and is monitoring particular uh, molecular processes. But here, what we're demonstrating is, is that we can actually image that, have a contrast enhanced image. Here, this is a test case. We're just sweeping out a W because we're from Washington. So of course we sweep out a W, but what it's showing is, is where the agent exists within, um, uh, within this tissue site. But what's different from what you do with conventional optics, this is done at 30 millimeters, so three centimeters deep into the body. Again, traditional optical processes, 
you're restricted to about a millimeter. Here we can go many centimeters into the body and we can have that molecular sensitivity. These images were made with nanomolar concentrations. So very, very small biologically relevant concentrations. And so we're able to monitor biological processes. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. But before I get to that is we saw the what, with the what this photoacoustic, but the why, because it allows us to get into the molecular world uh, using these contrast agents. But now the third piece is the implementation. How can you do this clinically? And so uh, there are many practical images which have limited the translation of the pause system. That is to bring it from these experimental um, uh, benchtop instruments into be used at the bedside for real uh, clinical imaging. The first is many applications will require real-time frame rates. If you've ever been around ultrasound and had the little ultrasound wands, is you stick them up to the body and you're looking at things in real time and typically have frame rates of anywhere from 50 hertz up to a kilohertz uh, uh, frame rates. Photoacoustics, if you're going to integrate it with ultrasound, must deliver uh, the same kind of uh, frame rates. The ultrasound industry is moving towards low cost, portable systems. The laser that I showed you to present that image on the previous slide is this laser here, okay? That's one unit Sharpie pen there. So this thing's about two and a half maybe Sharpie pens is the whole ultrasound imaging system. That's where the world of ultrasound is going. This is the pulse laser, high energy pulse laser that was used to make those images we saw before. Now, for those of you who are in, the, uh, in this business, you realize I'm being a little provocative. You can make smaller lasers than this. But the point is um, these lasers are inherently slow and bulky in order to get the energies that you need and is totally inconsistent with this handheld world of uh, um, medical ultrasound. And finally, is it has to feel and act like an ultrasound system. So to bring light into the object, you must deliver it seamlessly integrated with a handheld ultrasound probe. So our approach has been to take a different uh, uh, delivery system and laser source to try to do this ultrasound imaging. And what we've basically done is we've traded off a bulky, high energy, slow laser with a very, very fast laser at lower energies, but the trick that we have to do is we have to be able to scan that optical beam very, very rapidly so that we can make these real-time images. And that's what we did in developing an optical uh, switching system to do this. But this approach allows us to change the laser source from something that looks like this, this big bulk, bulky, slow, 20 Hertz, uh, high energy laser to one that looks like this. There's that unit Sharpie and this laser which is a, a diopone solid states, YLF is the lasing material. So it's 1053 uh, lasing nanometers, but this little laser you can hold in your hand, palm of your hand. So just like that ultrasound system you could hold in the palm of your hand, this laser you could hold in the palm of your hand. It works at kilohertz rates versus 20 Hertz, but is lower energies. This is typically about hundred millijoules. These we can work up to about five millijoules or so. The one I'll show you uh, here is just 2.2 uh, millijoules. But what can you do with something like this? That molecular sensitivity. So I'll let this play while I describe what's going on here and to show you how you can br bring this molecular sensitivity uh, into the world of traditional ultrasound using photoacoustics and this rapid scan approach. Okay, this is a mimic of a drug injection procedure which is done routinely in the clinic. And what's done there is that a needle will come in, you'll del deliver a needle into the tissue because you wanna deliver an agent, whether it's a pain relief agent, whether it's a contrast agent, whatever it is, is uh, you'll bring in the needle, you'll then inject that agent at a site. So you're guiding it with the ultrasound, you'll pull out that and you hope that you, you put the, um, the drug in the right place. So this is the traditional ultrasound. Here's the photoacoustics. So this is real time ultrasound background integrated with the photoacoustics. Photoacoustics can see the needle because the needle absorbs a lot of light, but more importantly, we can molecularly label the, con uh, the drug. Because again, we can work at the molecular level. So now we are imaging the drug, okay? Oop, that stopped. 
Let me see if we can get it going again. There we go. So now I'll just do it one time through. So you bring in, you can see the needle just like an ultrasound, you can see it. But unlike with the ultrasound, you can now label the drug. So when you inject the drug, uh -huh. is that what you want? You see the drug. Yeah. Now you pull out the needle. Remove. And you're imaging the drug. You can see where the drug diffuses. You see how the drug is used. Molecular imaging. You're, you're doing this at the molecular scale. Okay. Try to do this the next couple of minutes faster. I think you get that uh, feeling for that. At least I hope you get a feeling for that. The next is we've worked over the last few years to try to take this technology and get the full molecular characteristics of optics, which is to do spectroscopic imaging. So that is to be able to vary the wavelength of the light that's going in there, because that gives us a way to characterize the absorbers uh, inside the body. And we have built uh, devices, which are about two times the size uh, of these lasers uh, that allows full spectroscopy, okay? And that just tells me, yeah, we did build this thing. So this is not dry labbing, <laughs> it's a real system, real real time system. Okay, now what our approach, this fast scan approach to photoacoustics allowed us to address two issues, which are a, one a practical issue and one a fundamental issue in terms of trying to bring this full spect spectroscopic capability to clinical ap applications. The first practical issue is tissue motion. If you want to make measurements, over a range of wavelengths, then at, uh, as you're firing with the different wavelengths, it takes a finite amount of time to acquire the data. Because of that, if the tissue moves, you can misassign the spectral information. And so what you will get is a corrupted spectrum, which will not tell you what the true molecular constituents are within this imaging voxel, but will be some partial combination of a set of um, different molecular absorbers. That, if you could go infinitely fast, you could remove, but you can't go infinitely fast, but we have a practi our practical approach uh, to solving this problem allows us at the speeds of real-time ultrasound to totally eliminate this uh, motion artifact. That's the practical one. The fundamental one is we wanna look at spectroscopic information. That is, we want to see how light is absorbed as a function of the wavelength. However, as light diffuses into tissue, it also gets colored. And that is, is that the diffusion uh, coefficient is different depending on the optical wavelength. And so if you're looking at an object which is relatively deep in tissue, you can color the spectrum due not to the basic absorption, which is this fundamental molecular characteristic, but just the um, uh, light propagation, diffusion, the wavelength dependent diffusion of light. Our approach allows us to solve both of these problems. First of all, because we can fully interleave ultrasound and photoacoustic firings at these high frame rates, we have a collection of photoacoustic images and ultrasound images, which are registered in both space and time. We then use the conventional ultrasound images to do a very traditional signal processing uh, approach, which is used clinically in ultrasound and that's speckle tracking. So we track how this image goes around and we use the displacements that we estimate from that real-time speckle tracking to re-register the photoacoustic images to eliminate the motion artifacts. And I'll show you an example of that. The second is, is because of this fast scan approach where we can rapidly move the laser source across, it means we're illuminating the object from different spatial positions, which means if we keep track of the signal based on which fiber and resort them in terms of distance from the fiber to the absorber, we will map out the diffusion curves. And so with that information of the diffusion, we can correct for that, compensate. And so we compensate for the fluence and we do that in real time. So we do both the motion compensation and the fluence compensation in real time to allow us full spectroscopy. So how's it done? So let's look at that needle experiment again. But instead of just doing that at a single wavelength, we now intersperse these epics of where we're rapidly scanning through, in our case, we're doing 10 wavelengths so that we can get full spectroscopic information. Why do we do that? We do that because we want to differentiate different objects, different molecular absorbers in the image. So this is the simplest type 
of uh, separation where we have two different types of absorbers. One is the needle, which is delivering the agent. And the second is, is we, we engineer, we uh, nano engineer a particular agent to have a specific spectrum, which is within our wavelength range. And so we wanna be able to image the contrast agent versus the needle. So we make the images at the uh, different wavelengths. We then fluence compensate these. And so we can look at the uh, spectra now in, in an individual imaging voxel or pixel, right? And so if we look in this pixel here, as shown in the yellow, is we get a spectrum which looks very similar to the nanoparticle spectrum, okay? However, if we look at the pixel or voxel over here, we notice that the spectrum is totally different and is much closer to the spectrum we expect from the uh, metal absorbers in the needle, which means what? So we can do a standard optical trick, which is used all the time in optical spectroscopy, is we can do these spectroscopic projections and therefore make images of specifically the needle and an image specifically of the contrast agent. So we have that in the next slide. So here's the ultrasound picture. Here is the uh, just raw photoacoustics. Then here are the spectroscopic projections at three different time points within that delivery uh, sequence. Here in this column here, we're making, uh, GNR means gold nanorods. It's our particular contrast agent. Here we're making pictures of the contrast agent. And here we're specifically making pixels of the needle. Before we inject the contrast agent, we should only see the needle, we do. As we inject the contrast agent, we see both agent and needle. When we remove the needle, we just see contrast agent. So this is the simplest form of the spectroscopic uh, separation, but we're able to do this in real time, removing two of the major impediments to doing this within the clinic, which is motion artifacts, which is a practical problem, and the uh, wavelength dependent uh, fluence uh, variations, which is a fundamental problem, is we can uh, solve for both of these. That was a, a static case. This is in vivo in an animal model, and this is just showing uh, the motion. So again, we do the spectroscopic uh, uh, capture, but here now we have the different uh, images at the different wavelengths, but we have not compensated for motion in vivo. And what we find is when we're looking at the, the uh, image for the contrast agent is to get this blur in there because the agent's been moved all over, which is not uh, aligned with the true source. We then compensate for that motion and we get uh, almost one-to-one -one match between the spectrum of the contrast agent and what we find in the imaging voxels and you completely clean up and you can see the specific areas where the contrast agent has been delivered. Okay, so bringing molecular imaging into the world of handheld or at least small scale uh, uh, clinical ultrasound is what we're able to do with this fast scan photoacoustic approach. Okay, so that's when light generates sound. Let's go to the second one. This is where light detects sound. Why do you care? Why you care is this is places where you wanna do ultrasound inspection. So laser, we call it laser ultrasound, or the, the, the community calls it laser ultrasound, where you wanna do ultrasound inspection, but with no contact. So no ultrasound transducer uh, contacted, okay? So the rubric here, laser ultrasound, is one that you use light and you use pulse light, just like we did in that previous case with the photoacoustics, but now you tune the wavelength of this light. So all of the light is absorbed within the first few microns of the material, and it will generate perpendicular to the surface an acoustic wave which propagates in. So now we're probing the acoustic properties. Remember with photoacoustics, we were probing the optical absorption characteristics. Here with laser ultrasound, we're using all optics, but we're probing the mechanical, the acoustic characteristics of the medium. So this pulse light comes in, creates ultrasound. It reflects off of heterogeneities in the structure. Those uh, signals that reflect back to the surface are now detected with no contact using optics, okay? And no contact optical detection of ultrasound echo uh, signals at the surface using optical interferometry. This approach has been around for over 30 years, but it's had very, very limited applications. And the primary reason for that is, is that the optical detection of ultrasound 
is very insensitive, typically on the order of, th uh, typically about three orders of magnitude less sensitive than traditional contact applications. So it's really just in specialty applications where this has been applied. Our group over the last about decade or so has looked at the sensitivity issue for doing non-contact uh, ultrasound inspection with light and has focused on a fundamentally different approach for doing interferometry. Now, I'm not gonna go through this in detail. Um, and again, at the end with questions, any of you optics folks who are interested in learning more about this uh, interferometer, uh, happy to talk about it. We love talking about this thing. But um, it, it has a, a piece in here and, uh, uh, which um, is really can be implemented. It's actually an old idea, but it's the implementation in modern integrated optics, which makes it practical. And the idea is we're gonna do interference without a reference arm. So if anybody's done optical interference back in school or your optics person and do it routinely or you did it back in school, remember what you do with a conventional interferometer, you take a beam, you split it in two, one beam goes into, this, into the object, it reflects off what you're interested in, in monitoring. The second goes on the reference arm, typically just to a mirror and back. The two waves are recombined, they interfere, and that interference is what you detect with an optical detector. We've eliminated the reference arm. What we've done is, is we've changed time for a reference. That is, we take a broadband optical uh, light packet that's coming out of something like a, a superluminescent diode. We then split it into two paths like you do uh, in a typical interferometer. But now in that splitting, we change the propagation distance that each one of uh, those arms will take. That creates two packets which are coherent to each other. That is, is they're identical packets, but they're now time delayed. They both propagate down to the surface. They both reflect off the surface of the part. They come back. They automatically, through these polarization tricks, they automatically switch paths. So the one that went through the long path on the way in goes through the short path on the way back. The one that went on the short path on the way in takes the long path on the way back. These come back, they can be recombined. We do a, a, what's called a double differential approach of detection. And what this has done is gotten it back, got us back about two and a half orders of magnitude compared to the conventional uh, interference. And the reason is, is we have 100% modulation efficiency of the light because both arms, the reference arm and the signal arm ref reflect off the same object. So if this object has the corrugated surface or creates a speckle pattern, the reference arm will get exactly the same speckle pattern. And so you get 100% um, modulation efficiency. Just as long as you can capture enough light off that surface, you will have that efficiency. So that's the what. Now the why. Well, the motivation to get into this was, was uh, non-medical to start. And yes, you did see that truck just run into the fuselage of uh, this airplane, okay? And I was, this is a motivation to develop new, non-destructive, non-contact methods to look at composite materials. So I'll let this uh, truck go away. And it's a kind of a, 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 a funny cartoonish movie. because So here it goes again, truck coming in to this and wham, right into the fuselage uh, of this uh, plane. Okay, you say, ha, 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 that's you know funny event. Somebody found this on YouTube. Well, no, this happens once per year for every aircraft in the worldwide fleet, okay? Now, it may not be a truck in this cartoon fashion hitting it. It may be bird, a flock of birds strike. It may be a lightning strike. It may be some other kind of vehicle a strike, but on average, every aircraft in the worldwide fleet has this happen to them once a year, okay? And what do you do? If there's this kind of impact, what damage is there? Well, if it's an old <clears throat> metal aircraft, you could do visual inspection pretty well and have a very good idea, not an exact idea, but a very good idea of what the internal damage that resulted from an impact and then decide how to do that. But for composite materials, the materials which you use for the modern uh, aircraft fleet, the Boeing uh, 787, the Dreamliner, other uh, planes uh, like that, not clear what the damage is. And we'll look at that, okay? So I'll show you how so that was the why. The motivation is to try non-contact. Can you see why we might want non-contact? Wouldn't you like to have a little drone that could come in with light sources, fly over this area, and do an ultrasound inspection 
of that uh, right there as the plane uh, is seated uh, uh, at the airport can do that uh, inspection in situ and to look for three-dimensional damage. And that can be there and make a decision about what to do with that airport, take uh, airplane, take it off, allow it to fly, whatever, okay? So I'll show you how we can use this non-contact, but to do that, I have to have one slide to introduce you to this world of uh, imaging um, uh, components, air, air, aircraft components. Okay, so first of all, the simplest measurement, like I said, you have one pulse of the laser that creates an ultrasound wave, which propagates in. The reflected wave is then detected by this continuous wave laser using the Sanyak interferometer. For each laser firing, you get one line, what's called an A scan, one line of the reflected signal from the material. If you scan both the source and detector, and this is done electronically with electro-optic uh, steering we, uh, along one line, we can get, get a cross-sectional image of the object. And here, and that's of course a B scan. And here what we're looking at is a cross-section through one of these composite materials which are used in aerospace. It's a laminar or layered structure and you see all the layers, but also there can be defects or disbonds, for example, is a classic one, uh, between uh, the different lamina, which can show up. I will show you images where we have filtered out the basic structure and are just looking for these defects, okay? So you get in two dimensions. Then in three dimensions, if we mechanically scan in the third dimension, we can get as this raster scan of lines, i.e. a 3D data set. Now, what I'm going to show you is something which is used in the non-destructive evaluation world at display format, which is a little unusual, at least for me coming from biomedicine, was a little unusual. But they will show a movie of what are C scans. C scans are these cross sections, these lateral cross sections through the material. But as the movie plays, you'll be moving from the top surface to the bottom surface through this 3D data set. Okay, so at the beginning of the movie, you're looking at the top surface, and as the movie plays, you'll be going deeper, 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 deeper uh, into the material. Oops, get this back here. There we go. Okay, so here is a demonstration of this. And this was done with our friends at Boeing. That actually, of course, this is how we got into it. Our friends at Boeing are in, in Seattle. Uh, and they heard about some of the stuff we were doing and came to see us. And we set up a very nice long-term uh, collaboration with them to look at these aerospace components. So here's a composite material, a simple test of impact. You have a very simple a ball bearing drop, which is equivalent to 25 joules uh, of what's called a drop in impact. Visually, this is the little dimple on the surface. This is a component of a uh, aerospace component that's in there. <clears throat> After doing that impact, we scan it with our laser ultrasound, but then we cut out this section and we brought it into the medical center and did a micro CT. This is the gold standard for looking at impact damage in these materials for destructive testing. So this is something you can't do in the field, but this is uh, done in R and D settings in order to look at that. So this is the, the state of the art in sort of R and D inspection. This is something which is this little laser scanner and is going to be field deployable uh, in there. And we'll now make these movies, these equivalent C-scan movies, where the movie will start from the top, and we're going to move in depth through. So let's play it. And so what you're seeing are these delaminations, what they call the propeller artifacts, or propeller uh, uh, delaminations. And that is, you go from layer to layer to layer, as the fibers are rotating, the delaminations move with them as they move around. You can see that the volume, the volume that was uh, uh, delaminated here compared to the surface damage is enormous. This is why our Boeing and our composite friends want to do this work is because there's no way you could predict that level of three-dimensional damage, which is the need for scanning. But with this non-contact laser ultrasound approach, you can do the scanning um, uh, in the field deployable system. Let me just say one last thing. We are not to the, the drone and doing it on, on the aircraft, but we have uh, integrated um, two of these scanners into robots, which are now being used at Boeing in their um, 
uh, or they're, they're doing testing on it for it to eventually to be uh, incorporated into the composite manufacturing line. And then ultimately we're hoping to work over the next few years to do the field inspections. Now I'm a biomedical guy. So this was a diversion. We originally developed this for a number of biomedical applications. There's three, um, uh, and I'll just mention them. Uh, so, that. so we've been looking at three. One is called label-free flow cytometry. The other is photoacoustic or point of care um, histology. And then the last one is scatter-free photo uh, spectrophotometry. And so I wanna save a little time here to make sure I had the third section have plenty. So I'm just gonna do quickly say, what spectrophotometry is. Spectrophotometry is molecular profiling. It is used in the biomedical industries, uh, uh, in um, uh, drug discovery and those types of things um, uh, to look at uh, and monitor uh, molecules and how they're used in things like cell culture. When you have complex environments which can scatter light, traditional spectrophotometry doesn't work. We have looked at including photoacoustics, just like we talked, because remember photoacoustics gets over the scattering limit, photoacoustics, but to do it in the cell culture world and how, uh, how can we do that? We can't bring an ultrasound transducer into this, but we can bring light. And so that's what we're developing right now is a photoacoustic spectrophotometer, but that has no contact to the uh, tissue culture area. And so that re remotely, can uh, uh, do this um, uh, spectrophotometry in living cells. And we have published a couple of papers and I'm just gonna scan through that just to say that we have done this um, and uh, that we are now uh, putting a system together to try to uh, work uh, with some ph pharmaceutical companies to look if we can uh, do this in a high scan rate um, in a cell culture. Okay, so that was the second one. That's where we use light to detect sound and the motivation again for that is non-contact uh, detection of sound, either in this laser ultrasound system or in a photoacoustic system where you cannot bring in a traditional uh, ultrasound transducer. So let's do the third one. And this is, this is I think, the most fun because Lisa has the prettiest pictures. Um, and that is, we're going to talk about a system in which the fundamental imaging is done with light, optical coherence tomography, but we're going to use sound in a way which can tickle the light so that we can get quantitative information about elastic properties of tissue, but to do that without contacting tissue. Okay, so the rubric for this one is called optical coherence elastography. Our primary applications are in the cornea, within the eye, and the skin. We use uh, uh, the imaging, the fundamental imaging is optical coherence tomography, which is light, but we're going to use ultrasound in an unusual way to go in and tickle the medium in order to leverage the OCT uh, imaging to get uh, images of elastic properties with no contact. Okay. Now, Wait, why is the non-contact, let me just take a little uh, 30 seconds here on that, is why is the non-contact, well, not, you'll see from applications why you need the non-contact, but why is it hard to get elast elastographic information to get information about tissue mechanics with no contact? Well, the classic way that you get information is force deformation, right? You have an object, you put a force, you see how it deforms, and from that, you can invert that to find out what the elastic properties of the object are. Well, how do you put on a force when you can't contact, that's the issue, okay? And that's how we got into this game. Okay, so our motivation in this one was to assess the biomechanical properties of tissue without any contact. The applications, the cornea. In the cornea, we're looking at refractive surgeries. So in cases where it's with a, a pathology, which is advanced uh, keratoconus, where the, sphere, where the uh, cornea can't maintain its shape, under intraocular pressure. And so the things turn into cones rather than spheres and you lose focusing capabilities. Normal refractive changes, failed refractive surgeries. And just in general, ultimately we wanna be able to, to map the elastic properties of normal cornea for doing uh, planning. So doing plenty of things, even as simple as LASIK surgeries in the cornea. Obviously you want no contact uh, of the cornea when doing these tests. The second is in skin. And our primary application there has been in burn, 
but it can be used for any uh, reconstructive surgeries. And it turns out in the United States alone, there's on the order of 10 million skin grafts done per year. Okay, because it's not just for burns, it's also for cosmetics, it's also for reconstructive surgeries from, from uh, 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 cancer surgeries or any other kinds of uh, surgeries. But one of the things you're trying to do with those surgeries, the grafting, is to match the characteristics of the donor and recipient tissue. Two things tell you the, the likelihood of a successful graft. Number one is vascularization, how much blood. So is, is the, when you move this, will you be able to vascularize the, to uh, provide nutrients to that um, uh, graft so it will survive? It's number one. The second one is the elastic properties of the skin because you want them to match because you want the skin characteristics of where you're grafting to match those that you have so you provide the same sense of touch and feel or in your hands touch, but in general, the same uh, 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 sense of feeling uh, that you would have. In burn cases and many reconstructive surgery cases, you can't touch the skin. So how can you find out the elasticity? Well, you can't. And right now it's done as an art. So it's the surgeon's art to try to match that. We wanted to provide a quantitative non-contact tool to do that matching. Finally, small delicate uh, tissue samples. This is again in the areas uh, related um, uh, to tissue cultures and, and pharmaceuticals. Uh, which I won't talk about here, but again, there's another application when one look at evolving um, uh, elastic characteristics in tissue culture without any contact. Okay, so I'll focus primarily on the cornea. I'll just show you one result from the skin. Why do you want to know about corneal biomechanics? Okay, well, first of all, the cornea is the primary focusing lens of the human uh, visual system. Because it has a fixed optical index of refraction, its focal characteristics are determined by its shape. Its shape is determined by a simple uh, uh, biomechanics, biomechanical system. That is, there's pressure pushing on the corneal, the thin corneal uh, uh, partial sphere, pushing it out. And that uh, force comes from the intraocular pressure. The response is due to the elastic characteristics of the cornea. And it's supposed to be this balance to give precise shape, this spherical shape, which gives you ideal focusing on your retina for your human uh, visual system, okay? The clinical standard of care is to measure shape and to try to infer IOP often with um, uh, contact measurements uh, such as this. This is totally incompatible uh, with that. Uh, what we're trying to do, which is non-contact. And we also just, uh, neither one of these directly tells you about the elastic properties of the cornea itself. So our goals, our clinical goals from the system is to quantitatively map the elastic modulus uh, in the cornea. We want to measure the IOP independent of cornea. That is the current ways in which you measure IOP assume a singular elastic modulus for all human cornea, which is of course wrong. So we uh, want to uh, actually measure that as part of an IOP procedure to get accurate IOP measurements. And finally, to guide and optimize therapeutic interventions, like I said. In the remaining time, I'll just talk about the way in which we quantitatively map, map the elastic modulus, not the other ways in which we use that information. Okay, so again, the goal, we wanna quantitatively map the elastic characteristics of tissue with non-contact. So number one, we need non-contact imaging, but we have that. That's optical coherence tomography. We want it to be quantitative. We don't want to say something's hard or soft. We want to be able to predict how the cornea deforms under the intraocular pressures, and especially if we're going to make any interventions ultimately, is whether the changes in those deformations, you must have quantitative information about the elastic properties. And then the last one, which was the tricky one when we first started, is, okay, how can you do a classic elastographic measurement without any contact for the deformations. Okay, as I said, the non-contact imaging was uh, OCT. We were very fortunate at our lab at the University of Washington, two labs down from us, one of the world expert, experts in phase sensitive OCT. And so we uh, collaborated uh, with him, Ricky Wong, in order to uh, uh, get a high performance real-time uh, OCT system for our non-contact imaging. Quantitation. We use an approach, a dynamic elastography approach, and this is something, by the way, that, that colleagues and Tori, I think, I'm not sure if she's involved in these projects, but is uh, our folks at Mayo have been uh, intimately involved in this technology of a dynamic elastography where 
you launch a mechanical wave, and in, in the simplest case, a shear wave in tissue, the wave speed, so you use an imaging system to track that wave as it propagates, the wave speed in simple systems is simply related to the shear modulus of tissue. If the tissue is isotropic, then the Young's modulus, which determines deformations, has just a simple uh, scaling factor of three to that shear modulus. And so you can go directly from these wave speed measurements to estimates of the Young's modulus. The, traditionally, this has been done using either magnetic resonance imaging or ultrasound imaging. Here, we're going to use uh, uh, optical coherence tomography because the size scale, again, we're at the optical scale, gets us down into micron level, which would be appropriate uh, for the cornea. Okay, but the last one was, the, was the, the major issue. How can we get the deformation without contact? Well, as we said, we saw that in the optics, there are some contact approaches, but these are totally inappropriate for doing this sort of non-invasive, um, uh, uh, non-contact mapping of elastic uh, characteristics. So we looked at some approaches. There's a, a, a clinical tool called an air puff, which is used uh, for IOP measurements. We used our, uh, looked at our old friend photoacoustics, but well, we thought the most effective would be ultrasound radiation force, which is what's used in ultrasound elastography. But we can't bring a transducer up to the eye and couple the ultrasound into the, um, into the cornea. So we had to come up with this way. And this was a great idea for one of the postdocs in our lab at the group meeting who said, well, why don't we just bounce the ultrasound off the cornea, but have the ultrasound propagate through air? When it does that, you create a radiation force because you conserve momentum between the incident and reflected wave, which creates a little transient, a little tapping, which can launch a mechanical wave to which we can image. You say, wait a minute, you can get through ultrasound through air. Well, here's the first transducer and that's the fingers of the bright postdoc. And he put together a little transducer working at 400 kilohertz, which is about a, a little bit less than a millimeter wavelength in air and showing that you can get sufficient radiation force to move around uh, some salt on the platen. Okay, so we then uh, went back and redesigned some transducers and worked the real acoustics to create a device working between one and two megahertz, so that's wavelengths on the order of about 200 to 300 microns uh, in tissue of transducer that we can couple ultrasound to air, propagate it over distances which are large enough to ensure that we have no contact uh, uh, with the, the surface, but they're sufficiently strong enough that we can launch these mechanical waves, which we then track with the real-time OCT system. Okay, so this is uh, a simulation of what an experiment like that was. If you hit it here, you will launch surface waves and bulk shear waves. Using either one of those waves, the simple relationship between the modulus and the speed squared. Just note this is low fudge factor for the surface waves but otherwise it's the direct relationship between speed squared and modulus, okay? So if you now wanna make a picture is you have to track that motion uh, everywhere. So let's say if we looked along this top surface and drew a line, which is X versus time, if we just took the local derivative of that guy, the slope of this line is the wave speed. So we can track that wave speed as it propagates and make an image of the wave speed, which is related to modulus. Okay, that was the idea. So we put a real-time system together to do that. And we make pictures like this. So this is uh, in an animal model, it's a pig cornea. And the grayscale image is not ultrasound. The grayscale image is OCT, a 3D image of the cornea. The color imposed on top of it is these propagating mechanical waves. And we're looking at these waves as they propagate when we have the, uh, the cornea subjected to an IOP of 10 millimeters of mercury, which is a typical clinical value you would have versus a highly pathological value of 40 millimeters uh, of mercury. From, uh, by the way, this takes one third of a second to get this four dimensional uh, information. Okay, so you can take these wave fields, track them and do that simple slope analysis. And so you can make a 3D image of the wave speeds. And here we see the difference between what we get at uh, the, the low interactive pressure, what we get at the high interactive pressure, and we can see these large changes in elastic modulus due to this uh, pathological uh, case. So we thought, wow, this is cool. We can get right towards clinic. So we looked at this in the skin and the similar thing, what we found in the skin is the structure and orientation of the collagen fibers within the skin, which is determining its elasticity, correlates very strongly with what we see in our, um, 
are these Wayfield movies, these uh, uh, elastog elastograms, okay? You guys are good engineers. You see something like this, you say, wait a minute, is it really this easy? No, of course not. And normally you would say in a technical audience complications, but I'm a native New Yorker. And in New York, we don't have complications, we have problems, 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 problems. And you gotta solve all those problems. In the last five minutes here, is I'll talk about the two outer layers of the onion, which we have attacked, which is that complicates this, and that's guided wave behavior and tissue endosophagy. The first guided wave is we sued that simple model of those propagating shear waves and that track those waves, assumed you had an infinite medium. However, the cornea is very bounded, and that the wavelengths of which we use, which is hundreds of microns uh, for these mechanical waves, the cornea is right around the uh, size of those uh, thickness of those, the corneas, uh, of those wavelengths, okay? Cornea is about half a millimeter thick in, in humans, so 500 microns. So the simple case of this infinite simple waves, which we have the nice uh, uh, wave fields so that we can do local derivatives, where in this bounded world, we get reflections from the surface and we get complicated waveforms that if you now try to just get local derivatives here, you get garbage. Garbage has nothing to do with the elastic properties, has only to do with the limited geometry of the cornea. However, we know from mechanical analysis, something that we do in physical acoustics all the time, that these modes are very, are, that this wave propagation though is modal. And so by doing Fourier analysis, you can identify a different modes. You can then replot them and look at individual modes and track the dispersion that you have from these interactions. And from that then infer what the bulk uh, uh, module, the bulk wave speeds are, and get rid of this boundary effect. So this is dispersion analysis. Remember this, remember that word, use dispersion analysis to get rid of these um, limited uh, size or bounding behavior. Okay, that's number one. Second is is anisotropy. So here's the way you do traditional biomechanics experiments. Yes, two types of measurements is typically done. One, you extract a tissue sample, and then you do uniaxial loading on this. And you can do that to measure the Young's modulus uh, directly of the tissue. When you do that uh, in animal models for uh, corneal tissue, what you find is, is the Young's modulus is in the order of say three or four megapascals. Remember, megapascals. The second kind of typical uh, biomechanical test you make a tissue is a shearing. If you look over here, what you're taking is you're shearing the tissue with an arm and you measure the resulting uh, strain and from that directly measure the shear modulus. When you do that on tissue extracts uh, for uh, uh, the cornea, you find that the shear modulus is in the order of tens of kilopascals, okay? So remember that. So we now ask the question, is the cornea isotropic, okay? So if the cornea was isotropic, if you remember, of course you don't, but I'll remind you, if you remember at the beginning, we said that why we could just make these wave speed, to wave speed measurements to mechanical uh, characteristics is because in an isotropic material, the shear modulus, uh, excuse me, the um, Young's modulus determining these deformations is simply proportional to the shear modulus with this constant factor of three. But what about in the cornea? When the cornea, the E was megapascal, say about three megapascals we'll pick as typical. The shear modulus from rheometry measurements is on the order of 25 kilopascals. Three times 25 is 75 kilopascals an order and a half magnitude off. E does not equal three mu uh, that's in there. And so uh, the isotropy assumption for the cornea is radically uh, wrong. Okay, so is the cornea, no. But we have found that we can modify the elastic modulus of a matrix of a uh, simple um, isotropic material to better mimic the layered structure that you have in the cornea of co layered collagen fibers, that we do that and we call this a, a NITI model, which is a, a nearly incompressible transverse isotropic. So transverse means you have isotropy in the plane, okay? And so we can look at these and for an incompressible material, the Young's modulus is given by uh, three mu, the one modulus, but the torsional forces are given by G. So these two separate shear moduli tell us one about compressive behavior, and other about uh, uh, fundamental uh, shearing. We said, we got it, right? So we, if we go off and try to measure these two uh, constants, we can determine everything about the deformations of the cornea. 
Okay, allows us to decouple that. So then we went to the simplest case. Okay, before we start doing bounded materials and this other stuff, what's the simplest case? We have this transverse isotropic material when we launch its bulk and we launch these waves into bulk and we just track them like we did for those uh, corneal uh, measurements. What we find is the speed of the wave is traveling according to G, G only, which means our measurements, if it was a bulk material, would be dominated by G, not mu. And the, the, what we care about is these deformational characteristics in tension, because that's what determines the shape of the cornea primarily under the force of the intraocular pressure. And our wave means didn't tell us anything about that. So depression. <laughs> personal depression. But this is one time in my life where a bug became a feature. And that is, is when we looked at this, because cornea was a bounded material, it actually coupled the wave. So the dispersion relations here changed based on the ratio of mu to G. And I'll just scroll through this and then finish with a couple of slides to show the results. And that is what we found in the dispersion relations that the lower frequencies in the dispersion relation were determined primarily by mu, the upper by G. So that if we had the appropriate model is we could take these uh, uh, dispersion analysis in the, uh, in the cornea. So mixing together dispersion with an anisotropic model and from that estimate both mu and G. And this was just uh, looking in the phantom which is isotropic versus a true uh, pig cornea which is, has this anisotropic when we fit to the anisotropic model, we have a much better fit than assuming uh, isotropy, whereas for the phantom, it's a perfect fit for the uh, isotropic case. But when we do that fitting, what allows us to get is both moduli simultaneously. The Young's modulus, which tells us how it deforms under tension, and the shear modulus, which tells us how it is deforming under shearing. And this primarily determines, and so for the first time with a non-contact, non-invasive device, we're able to monitor, measure, and map the uh, fundamental, uh, quantitatively mapped the fundamental elastic parameter, which is determined shape in the cornea. So I went through these three a little bit longer than I expected, sorry, but, uh, but uh, one where we used uh, light to generate sound, which is the photoacoustic, one where we used light to detect sound, which is the laser ultrasound, and finally this where we used uh, sound to tickle light um, uh, for optical coherence elastography. So I want to thank uh, all the people. These are faculty colleagues that have worked with me over the last few years. These are the last round of postdocs. This is our funding sources, which have helped with this. And I want to thank you for uh, uh, staying with me and uh, listening to this lecture and happy to, to talk at length uh, if you have any questions. Thanks. And I'm going to do two things. I'm going to stop sharing. Whoa. I'm going to change cameras and stop sharing. Okay. Let me get a second. Questions? Tori, anything from last time that all of a sudden struck you this time? Um, I think there was some discussion about uh, contrast versus CNR. Um, so you talked about how it improved contrast, but I don't think you really touched on um, noise comparison uh, between. This, this an ultrasound? You mean for the photoacoustics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the, uh, the contrast here is, you know, it's a different mechanism. So it's the, uh, what you're really trying to do, unlike you have like a traditional ultrasound uh, contrast, is you're just looking at the agent, for example, and just seeing where it goes. Here, <clears throat> we can characterize. So if I send in multiple agents, for example, that had different spectra, I can see those different ages. So I can image those different ages. So if they're tagged to a particular molecular species, then you can be looking at multiple processes simultaneously. So that's one of the things. So that's the contrast. So you have this spectroscopic the noise. Yeah. So we are starved for uh, signal in photoacoustics. We're always fighting signal to, uh, to noise ratio. But um, We've been able uh, for a number of realistic applications and the one we've been focusing on is procedure guidance. So like injecting things uh, for ablations, for pain management, for a lot of uh, different applications uh, where we have sufficient signal to noise ratio to be able to do that. So our contrast is almost infinite. <laughs> so that's not the issue, it's the noise. We just have 
we're constantly fighting uh, the noise levels because um, as light diffuses and goes into tissue, its intensity decreases with depth. So uh, for the same level of absorber, when you're deeper, you get a smaller signal. And so you're always fighting uh, the noise characteristics uh, there. Um, but again, our fast scan system allows us to do a lot of things to uh, uh, bring back some of the signal to noise ratio and contrasted noise uh, ratio that you can't with the slow lasers. For example, doing a little bit of uh, uh, persistence or a signal average, you know, effectively signal averaging, but in smart ways to try to bring back some of the, uh, uh, or try to reduce the effects of noise. And one other thing I want to know was, uh, what are the barriers or, or what would you have to say to a physician to convince them that they should start incorporating this type of technique, other than like the obvious, like, oh, you'd have to produce it, but uh, what are the next steps? Well, okay, so it's good because we just have a nice new uh, big NIH grant, which is a what's called an academic industrial partnership, where we're going to work with General Electric. And so we're putting together uh, a clinical system working with uh, using a general electric scanner, which we're integrating our optical delivery system and all that with them. And we're gonna go into uh, try to focus on a specific procedure, which is um, to optimize uh, thyroid ablations. So when you bring in and do uh, uh, ablations within the type, because when you have thyroid cancer, usually the primary way which is treated is surgical, but then follow on, because about 30% of those will still have recurring cancers, but they're smaller, is you try to mitigate them with just some ablations. You bring in chemical agents, ablations. They have no idea where the agents go. You bring them in with ultrasound, you do it. So ours is just, I think the first level is to try to get the physicians, these interventional radiologists who are, who are doing this, to be actual in a real procedure to see the drug, to see that and to show that you can do that. And then the second piece of that, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a spectroscopic capability um, to quantitatively show that the area that has been treated is that you've ablated the vasculature. So therefore it's not gonna regrow in that region. So you gotta show them that directly. You can't talk it to them and say, you're gonna do that. You have, to, you have to show them that. And that's why we're focused on, and we've done this with other technologies over the you know over many many years is is that is to work with companies to get stuff into clinical testing because it's only with clinical testing that you can overcome those kinds of barriers that are traditional which are good barriers right physicians are fundamentally uh conservative do no harm um but this is the to show that you can actually see the agent as you're delivering it and see and quantify its effect of that agent um during the procedure very interesting. Thank you. Sure. Uh, quick question. Um, sure. Or maybe not quick, but uh, on the. That's on okay. The... <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. Dinner won't be ready for a half hour, so uh, um, I can remember I'm two hours behind you all. <laughs> um, I'm I'm wondering um, if on the subject of do no harm, is there any uh, special safety considerations or risks that uh, have to be mitigated for these techniques? Sure. Absolutely. So the biggest effect is the uh, optical delivery, uh, so the optical fluences, right? So, uh, which is in terms of uh, joules per centimeter squared and also the radiances, which is watts per centimeter squared. Okay, so it's, you know, dose. And um, you, uh, because uh, photoacoustics uh, is not yet, well, I should say it's for, for um, experimental use, but it's not, gen it's not for routine clinical use. It's not FDA approved. The, uh, there's never been a uh, document about what the levels are that uh, uh, would be truly safe for use. So what everybody is defaulted to is defaulted back to uh, the OSHA requirements <laughs> for uh, laser exposure. So we actually have very, very low optical uh, exposures um, in doing photoacoustic, which is some of the reasons we have these signal to noise ratio uh, issues. So coming into it, we're fundamentally way, way, way below um, any uh, safety issues. I'll just jump to something else, which is in that um, a non-contact OCE where we're making these deformations with no contact, there was a worry about, you know, what's the ultrasound intensities we use. 
they're tiny, they are one hundredth of the intensities which are used in traditional ultrasound uh, because we're looking at vibrations and displacement which are nanometer scale because we have OCT to detect them. So we use light to detect them. So we can use very small displacement. So yes, we do worry about that in every system we do because we do go into the clinic a lot. Um, and uh, we're nowhere near any kind of uh, safety limits in, in the systems I described tonight. So is are these um, OSHA mandated um, uh, limits, are they kind of, are you bumping up against them when you're, when you're talking about SNR? Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we do. So, we go right. We go right to the limits for the ocean. But remember, that's occupational safety. That's, sure, sure. It's a random light that, that uh, exposes to you. You don't so, have to wear. You have to wear goggles or anything when you're using these systems. Right, right. No, I'm just thinking. I'm thinking in terms of that's that's a you know that's limiting the kind of a, also on the flip side that's limiting the potential because I mean yes, exactly. You, go you, talk. You, Go talk to the FDA, please. We're happy to help you. Come with us to the FDA. But our, our approach is the opposite. Sorry to interrupt, but our approach is the opposite. We're going to work with it because we know that there's applications that will be useful that we can work uh, at, at these OSHA levels. Okay. And again, uh, to Tori's question about adoption, right, and, and getting physician buy-in is to have to go to the FDA just to convince the FDA that maybe the physicians will be interested. Usually it's not a winning pathway. Mm -hmm. um, but going in and doing applications where you can do it at these lower light levels uh, and show that it's value is a great step towards then going back to the FDA and say, okay, let's pump up the power by factor of 10 or let us do safe, you know, real, real well-designed scientific safety studies about what the limit should be. That, that makes sense. That's a, that's a shrewd way of doing it. Well, I hope so. It's what, it's what I'm we're going to do. I don't, know how, I don't know how shrewd it is, but it's certainly what we're going to try to do. So. Cool. There's a question in the chat. Oh, let me look. It, yep. Any any optimum incident angle relative to incident light in OCE? Uh, so in OCE, um, so so if the incident angle of the, of the acoustics, it doesn't really matter. But within like 45 degrees, it doesn't matter. The incident light in OCE, I mean, in optical coherence tomography into the cornea, yeah, you have to be, you want uh, uh, to be normal to the surface is the best and you can't be. So you do get some artifacts in just conventional OCT uh, of the cornea. If you looked at those movies, try to remember the movies where I had the, the uh, three dimensional picture of the cornea and the waves, the colored waves were propagating through. If you looked at the grayscale, you saw a little black dot right in the middle. That's the apex of your cornea and that's a specular reflection. So the light came in and bounced off and then didn't, didn't get in um, or create that artifact. Light got in, but it was lower amplitude. Um, so yes, you do care about that. But again, you have, you have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, freedom. The good news for the OCE is, is we don't care that much because if our signal to noise ratio goes down because it's it, the angle is not optimized, we don't care because we're measuring speeds of waves, right? So if the amplitude is, it just makes, you know, your signal to noise ratio gets lower, so your error gets a little bit bigger, but you don't fundamentally change the measurement because of that. So, so we're actually pretty robust, uh, robust for that. Good. One of the things I should say, so just like that's another theme. I don't know where we got into this, maybe about three or four years ago, we started becoming robot crazy. So, and I think it's because the first time with that laser ultrasound system, when we integrated into a robot with Boeing for that, we realized a lot of things can be integrated. So our OC, we're building two new OCE uh, systems, again, with nice grants from uh, NIH, but one for cornea and one for skin for the burns. Those are going to be robots. So they're going to come in and automatically do measurements to adjust, to try to optimize the angles of both the optics and the ultrasound. So that once you go, it's, it's totally real time and it's an optimal delivery. So, and these non-contact approaches give you that flexibility, just like an optical system. Let's see, is there a chat, another chat one? 
Yeah, so have you found uh, wave speed changes depending on the orientation of the acoustic wave because of it? No, uh, not, not dramatically. Like again, we, to, up to like about 45 degrees, we don't, we don't see it. The anisotropy is huge in the cornea. Like I said, it's about an order of magnitude and a half uh, that's in there. That's the, that's the big one. And so um, when we launch these waves, it's that dispersion relation that we're exploiting. And so it's sort of the relative weight of what's happening at the low frequencies versus the high frequencies. And that's kind of, that's kind of insensitive uh, uh, to the angle. The angle, again, is more the strength of these waves, not their propagation characteristics. And we're getting all the information out of the prop, uh, 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 propagation characteristics. OK, there's a question that says, how, uh, is that OK? Who, who asked that? Well, that was uh, Maureen. Maureen that was, is that okay? Maureen? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Okay. And then uh, Jilin, how to resolve depth when using external interferometer? Good. So uh, with depth, as the waves come out, your surface is vibrating, right? Continuously vibrating. It's vibrating at ultrasound frequencies, which is megahertz. Okay. Our light source is partially coherent. So it only remains totally coherent to itself over uh, time scales, which are uh, many times faster than that. So when we're doing this interference, it's effectively real time. Okay, so you have many, many waves with optically, which come together to interfere, but compared to ultrasound, it's instantaneous. And so, it looks just like the output of an ultrasound transducer. So just when you're looking at the interferometer output is you'll see this, the, the modulation, the signal, which is the modulation, which is just the interference, but it's over only over the packet of that, that broadband light source. And which, like I said, is many times because you know, it's speed of light versus speed of sound, that kind of ratio, which is 10 to the fifth in these materials. So you have 10 to the second, you know, so you have a hundred, 100 uh, uh, optical waves, which could be interfering, you're still three orders of magnitude faster than you need. So that's the way it's done. So collect data itself. So we collect data at rates which are comparable to the ultrasound rate. So we collect data at the tens to maybe 100 megahertz rates, not at the uh, optical rates, right? Which would be above terahertz would be, uh, you know, because terahertz is below uh, visible light. So, um, yeah. Good. All right. Is there anything else? Any, anyone else have one, maybe one more before we uh, conclude? If not, uh, I, I want to send my, uh, my my sincere appreciation and and thanks, Matt, for uh, spending tonight with us. I, I think it's great to have a general IEEE section willing to, oh, yeah. to, to go out there for something which is a uh, uh, pretty you know narrow. Uh, yeah, narrow and, piece. And, and that's the way we work in our in these smaller sections, right? A lot of our societies kind of. Uh, um, well, we we team up and and uh, and join together because there's there, there's not a lot of um, uh, not a lot of specialty or or, or um, if we get too specialized, then the, the audience shrinks pretty good. So yeah, we're we're always welcome. We're yeah. happy to and take on these a uh, little more narrow topics. Right. So hopefully, I just gave you this impression that that we always think of the worlds of optics and and sonics or acoustics and optics, and that when you mix them together, there's all kinds of cool stuff you can do. And I just showed a couple of things, but there's lots of different cases uh, where by bringing these together, it's just like an orthogonal dimension, which allows you to do uh, a bunch of stuff. So just that's the one thing to keep in the back of your head when you leave this. Sounds good. Thank All you right. very much. And okay. again, for, for you, those, Matt. yep, thank you, Matt. And then for those of you that did join late, uh, just to, I'll reiterate my, my uh, announcements from the beginning. Um, again, we're, we're, we're looking to maybe uh, find a venue that we can get back in person in December. Um, and and we'll, we'll we'll try to make sure that that's hybrid in case there are still those that, that choose not to join us. Um, we're looking for uh, uh, anyone who, or call, I guess it's a general call for nominations for elected positions. 
if you have any interest, um, email me or any of the other officers. Um, you should have my email address in your inbox probably multiple times by now. And then if, um, what, was my, what was my last one? Oh yeah, if you have any additional uh, speakers or topics in the upcoming uh, months, feel free to share those with us as well. Thank you all for joining. I, I, uh, I hope you all got something out of it. And uh, we'll, this is also being recorded and we'll make sure it gets up on our, on our YouTube page so that you can pass that around to uh, your colleagues as well. Thank you and have a good night. All right. Good night, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.